Okay, so good morning, everybody. How are you? Good. So, you know, I forgot to tell you last week when we met that I'm a huge sports fan, right? And I'm a huge, huge New York sports fan. So I love the Yankees. I like the Nets, the Mets. I love the Knicks. Absolutely love the Knicks, so I'm dying right now. Um, I don't like the Nets. Don't like the Nets, they're on New Jersey, so I don't consider them a New York team. And I love the Giants, they're out of the playoffs, but you know, better luck, luck, luck next year. So I say all of this to say that my mood really, you know, goes and comes with how well my New York teams are doing. So that being said, we want to all root for the Knicks, right? We want to all root for the Knicks to do well this season, at least to get in the playoffs, right? Okay. How many people are Nick fans? Just one person's a Nick fan? <laughs> Two? It helps with your grade. <laughs> so is anyone a basketball fan? Yes. Nets? No. Oh, what? Okay, I, I like the Sixers. I can go with the Sixers. I, as long as you don't say Boston. <laughs> no Boston Celtics fans, right? So who are you rooting for in the playoffs, the Super Bowl? Denver. Denver. Seahawks, Denver. I'm kind of torn. I'm, I, I think I'm rooting for Denver because at least a Manning will be in the playoffs. <laughs> you know, it's not our Manning, but at least a Manning nonetheless. Okay, so I just want you to know. So if I come in depressed some days, or you think I'm really being mean, it's probably because the Knicks lost. So let's, let's hope we can reverse their losing trend. All right, so let's talk about professional standards. Um, obviously, you know, accounting, it's a profession, and so we have standards that we have to abide by. Um, so we're going to talk uh, about those standards today, and I'm going to stress uh, the standards that I really want you to focus on. I'm not going to expect you to memorize all of the professional standards. I have not memorized all the professional standards, and there's no need to do that but you need to be aware of the fact that we do have professional standards and what those professional standards entail. The one thing that we will spend quite a bit of time talking about is, is auditor independence because of the importance of that. And so we'll talk a, a bit about that today, quite a bit about that today, and we'll come back to that throughout the semester, uh, talking about it. So um, when we talk about professional standards, uh, as I pointed out last week, we are going to talk about non-public companies as well as public companies, uh, with a greater focus for our purposes being on public companies. And the reason I make that distinction is because we have uh, two sets of, uh, we have sets of standards that apply to public companies and sets of standards that apply to privately held companies. And so the AICPA statement on auditing standards governs uh, privately held companies and also publicly held companies if there's not a PCOB standard, right? So when the PCOB, because remember, the PCOB was basically uh, formulated after all of the audit failures and accounting uh, failures, right? After Enron, WorldCom, it arose out of Sarbanes-Oxley Act for the most part. And so the PCOB is relatively new, a new regulatory body. And the PCOB became responsible for public uh, uh, oversight over the accounting profession after those, those scandals. And one of the things that uh, the PCOB started to do was issue standards, right? So, for example, when we talk about risk assessment, we'll talk about the risk assessment standards, and you'll see uh, that the PCOB has several risk assessment standards in response um, to uh, you know, what they saw as deficiencies in the auditor's assessment of risk um, uh, as they were auditing their clients. And so the PCOB issued these risk assessment standards, and those risk assessment standards supersedes the AICPA standards on risk assessment if you're a publicly held company. So publicly held companies have to follow the PCOB risk assessment standards. Um, and not the AICPA standards. So there are a lot of standards that the PCOB did adopt from the AICPA, so, uh, or the state, uh, the Auditing Standards Board. So they do, so you will see there's an overlap. But when there are specific PCOB standards publicly held, for publicly held companies, auditors have to follow 
the PCOB standards. So you'll see that as we're going through the semester, we'll talk about PCOB standards, which are usually termed AS, auditing standards. Right? So it'll, for example, uh, the, the risk assessment standards are AS12 and AS13. So we'll refer to those standards, and then you'll see in some cases we'll have statement on auditing standards such as SAS 99, which pertains to fraud, right? Because the PCAOB at this point, ha they haven't issued a specific standard on fraud or auditor's responsibility with respect to fraud. So auditors follow the statement on auditing standards uh, issued by the AICPA, okay? So we'll see, for publicly held companies, we'll see both standards being referred to. Um, as you know, financial accounting, we have generally accepted accounting principles. With auditing, we have generally accepted auditing standards. And those generally accepted auditing standards, there are three components to those standards. Uh, responsibilities, which deals with basically the auditor, right? So ethical, you know, ethical conduct, independence, um, objective, objectivity, integrity. So the responsibility um, principles deals with characteristics of the auditors or expectation of the auditor's character. Um, the performance standards deals with the conduct of the audit engagement. So standards that govern the conduct of the audit engagement. So for example, the auditors have to perform the audit with due professional care. Um, they have to uh, obtain sufficient and appropriate evidence. They have to staff the audit with the, uh, the appropriate level um, and experience of auditors. Right, so that's what the, the performance standards report, uh, deal with, the conduct of the audit. Whereas the reporting principles deals with the communication of the audit right, results. So, so the, the audit report. Right, so it covers what the standards that, so an audit report has to have, for example, uh, that is, it's conducted by an independent, that the auditors are independent. It has to point out that the responsibilities of the financial statements are the clients and the auditor basically performs, is, is uh, testing uh, and examining uh, records, okay? So those three principles, and then also we have standards on the quality control of the firm, and that deals with uh, firm level issues. So for example, the firm should have quality control practices in place, uh, things like um, the firms should have, shouldn't wait on the PCOB to come in and evaluate their audits, right? They should have, a, a, you know, peer reviews or they should have in-office reviews. So, for example, um, the New York office might go out um, and audit uh, clients of the Chicago office or clients of the, you know, Los Angeles office. So there's, the, they should have standards in place. They should have, for example, insure, ways of ensuring that their auditors are in compliance with independence rules, right? Because if the auditor is not in, if your individual auditors are not in compliance with your independence rules, then the firm's at risk, right? The firm is gonna be sued. The firm is gonna be sanctioned in addition to those uh, employees, right? So uh, the firm should have uh, practices in place to ensure that their auditors are independent. And we'll talk more about some of the things that they do to ensure that as we, when we talk about independence. Um, basically, we generally accepted auditing standards. Remember, the standards are geared toward the fact that auditors are expressing an opinion on the financial statements, right? And they're expressing that opinion um, that basically says that the, they're obtaining reasonable assurance, right? And why do you think it's reasonable assurance? We talked about this a little last week. Why, again, is it just reasonable assurance? as opposed to absolute assurance. What do you think? Yes, Victoria. Exactly. Jimmy? Right. The auditors don't create the financial statements. They're testing on a sample basis. Ricardo? Right. 
Right, exactly, extremely good point, right? There, you're, you're taking their assumptions in the financial statements, right? Because we know that there are estimates in the financial statements. So management's making some estimates about that. So they can only provide reasonable assurance about the, the statements, uh, the financial statements. What they're, and what they're providing reasonable assurance about is that they're free of material misstatement. So when we talk about materiality, we'll, we'll, revisit, we'll visit this topic of material. What does that mean? But on the face of it, what does it mean to you? If you had to phantom a guess, what does it mean, so Ella? It the way, uh, the exactly, right? So the, and, and that's a very good definition of materiality, is wh how, would a use, how would this affect would this affect the decision of a user, a reasonable, knowledgeable user of the financial statements? And that's basically the, the concept of materiality. Now, there are ways to calculate it, but that's the overall concept. Yes, Ricardo? Right. a certain threshold that auditors take into consideration? Right. Like testings? Right. Is there a threshold they go by? Mm-hmm. Right. And we'll talk about that more, but yes. So the auditors have to decide. So to be able to decide whether you, you don't know what's going to affect, right? Because we all have different thresholds in terms of what we consider material. You know, some of us, if we lose $100, that's a lot of money to us. Other people, it might be, oh gosh, like dropping a dime, right? So it's not that important. So when you have this universe of people who are relying on the financial statements or using the financial statements to make uh, uh, investment decisions or lending decisions, you couldn't possibly as an auditor know what's going to affect each and every person individually. So as Ricardo pointed out, auditors use guidelines to determine materiality, right? They use thresholds, and I won't go get into those yet because we'll talk about those in a couple of weeks, but they're, they're, they're guidelines that they use to determine what is material. Okay, and we'll talk about that next week, uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, and basically, the generally accepted accounting principles, again, are, are geared to, uh, I'm sorry, not accounting principles, uh, generally accepted auditing standards are geared toward the, the auditor's report and the auditor's opinion. So the, uh, the process of the audit, of collecting evidence, right, and evaluating that evidence in, in, with the objective of issuing an opinion or providing an opinion on the company's financial statements because that, that audit report is then communicated to interested users. Um, as I pointed out, the components of GAAP, right, you have fundamental principles which basically guide the conduct of the audits. You also have PCOB standards and ASB standards. Remember I talked about that you have, for publicly held companies, they're going to adhere to um, ASB, uh, uh, PCOB standards, um, and in the absence of any PCOB standards, they adhere to ASB uh, auditing standards. And then you have interpretive publication, publications, which are basically guides. Um, so for example, uh, certain industries have very unique transactions. And what you'll see is that there will be, uh, for example, um, uh, audit, an audit guide for the um, financial services industry, right? Because they're very complex transactions, they're unique, um, and so you'll have a guide for that. Not that they supersede PCOB standards or ASB standards, but they're more interpretive and they guide the application of generally accepted auditing standards. So it provides more guidance uh, for those particular industries. You, you also have audit guides for the audit of um, state and local governments or the audit of um, Ut uh, utility companies, those types of things. Um, so let's talk about independence. I had hoped that I would be able to show you a video that, but I couldn't get it to work, that talks about independence, but I'll post the video for you so when you uh, have some time you can take a look at it. But it just basically summarizes in a, a little bit more light way the um, principles of audit independence. So one of the key principles, under the responsibility principles, one of the key characteristics or, or key requirements is that the auditor is independent, right? The auditor has to be independent. They have to, you expect them to be um, independent both in fact and both in appearance, and we'll talk about that in, in, in more detail. 
other things under the responsibility principles is that the auditor has to have the capabilities to perform the audit, right? You don't want your car mechanic giving you advice about investing in a company, right? Well, maybe he's a, you know, has his, you know, a broker's license or something and he's just fixing cars because he likes to, I don't know, right? But generally you're not gonna go to your car mechanic to give you advice about whether or not you wanna invest in a company. Right? You want to know also that if you're looking at this audit report, that the auditor who performed the work is competent, they're capable. And you want to know that they, you know, at a minimum, they it went to a four-year college and got a degree in, in accounting. Okay, that they, you know, continue with continuing professional education, that they're knowledgeable about what they're doing. You want to be able to rely on that. So experience and expertise is important. And what you'll find in, when you go to public accounting firms, or even if you go to work in private industry, your learning doesn't stop, right? You always, uh, you're always going to be put in a, uh, you know, be expected to continue your professional education by attending seminars, um, uh, you know, and reading and keeping up, updated on what is happening in, in your profession and new standards and how those standards would affect your clients or your company. Uh, I'll get, talk about independence uh, in, a, in a moment. Due care, the auditor has to exercise due care in the performance of the audit. Right? So that they have to, when they make decisions, and remember I talked about the fact that a lot of auditing is judgment. It's not black and white. There are certain things that are black and white given how the accounting principles, generally accepted accounting principles, are written, right? So for example, black and white is cut off. When, if the cut off, did I ship the goods? The, uh, our year ends on 1231. Did those goods leave your client's uh, warehouse on or before 1231? If it did, you can recognize the revenue, right? Because that's one of the, the, the criteria under revenue recognition, right? Did we ship it? And that's an indication that ownership changed hands when it's shipped, right? So that's pretty black and white. You can look at it, you have a, defi a definitive date, so there's no real judgment there. So anyone reasonable would expect that if they saw that something was shipped on 1231 that the revenue is valid, right? Or, or that the, you could record the revenue. But then we also have elements of generally accepted accounting principles that are highly judgmental. Think about, as I said, allowance for doubtful accounts, obsolescence reserves. Or if it's a company that has uh, financial instruments, then you have to be concerned about fair value. Um, it, you know, it's easy to determine um, the value of stock, of a company's stock that's traded on the New York Stock Exchange, right? You can go to any number of indices on websites or you know, uh, financial websites and find out what that stock is trading at, right? You go to, new, you could look it up and find out. So that's what we, in financial accounting, right? Uh, the financial accounting over that, that would be considered a level one security, right? Because you can determine what the stock price is. So a reasonable user could kind of backtrack, do exactly what you did and find out what the stock price is. But then we also have those investments that are not readily tradable, right? There's no ready market for it. So there's an element of judgment. And that goes on, a it, there is a degree. You have level twos and level threes, right? So the value, it's not observable. So there's judgment involved. So how does the auditor determine whether or not that amount is recorded at its fair value, right? They're gonna have to rely on information that's coming from different sources, right? Whether they use a third party expert, evaluation expert, whether they use the client's information or whether they use their own, right? There, there's judgment involved in that. And that's where you, you wanna, see, obviously throughout the audit you wanna have due professional care, but you, there, are a lot of, there could be a lot of things that someone coming behind the auditor, such as the PCOB, to look at their work could say, you know, that wasn't a reasonable assumption. That's not the assumption that I would make, right? So the due professional care is extremely important. And when we talk about documentation and 
uh, of audit evidence. We'll talk about how important, why it's so important to document um, your audit approach and document your audit of findings and your rationale for your conclusions on particular areas, especially in those areas that are very judgmental or very subjective, right? Because you want to make sure that a reasonable user could see how you arrived at that conclusion. Even if they disagree with your conclusion, the f that they can track how you arrived at that conclusion and say, okay, well, that makes sense, but here's why I might disagree. Professional skepticism, we're going to talk about that a lot next week. Um, professional skepticism um, is kind of this, um, this, this area or that's very um, kind of vague, right? Uh, but yet it's throughout the standards. The standards, and when we talk about professional skepticism, we'll talk about it more. The, the standards mention professional skepticism throughout. There's no standard that says this is the standard of professional skepticism. Instead, what you'll see is throughout the, the auditing standards, you, you'll see that there's reference made to this concept of professional skepticism. And basically, what professional skepticism in a nutshell is that auditors should have a questioning mind, right? And make a critical assessment of the evidence in front of them. So basically, you know, don't accept things blindly. You don't want to assume your clients are crooks because that's not going to go over well for you retaining that client if, if you walk in there and you think that they're crooks, right? Even if you don't think, if you don't verbalize that, your audit actions will show that, right? Because you will gather a lot of evidence, you'll talk to them, you'll, you'll question everything they do, and you might, be, you know, and you, you might not be conducting a, more, a very efficient audit, right? Which is why we get to this, the, the process of risk assessment, right? So you want to suspect, you want to have this, you want to go in and say, n not assume that they're guilty, but don't also assume that your clients are or, you know, up upstanding citizens either, right? You want to have a healthy dose of skepticism. You want to question things, right? So we'll talk more about that. Question in mind and critical assessment of the evidence. And then judgment, right? The auditor has to be able to apply judgment. As I pointed out, I gave the example, so I won't reiterate those, but there's a lot of judgment involved in auditing. And two auditors can look at the same set of facts and come to a very different conclusion, right? Because of judgment. Experience is going to affect how you judge that issue or how you analyze that issue or, or the conclusion that you come up with that issue, right? So there's a reason that you won't have first year staff accountants auditing a complex account such as fair value, right? You're not gonna have them do that because they don't have the experience and the expertise in that area that a, a senior or a manager or a partner would have to audit that. And, that. and because those areas require a lot of judgment, you want, ju you want those people who are looking at those areas or auditing those areas to bring to that their level of expertise and experience so that they can make a sound judgment. So it's the application of your training, your knowledge, and your experience and making an informed decision about the audit evidence. So let's talk about auditor independence. In um, the academic literature, and this is something that academics have you know, done research on for years and years and years um, because of the importance of auditor independence. Um, and one uh, definition is auditor independence would be the probability that an auditor will report an error in the financial statements the probability that they will report the error in the financial statements given that they've discovered it. So you have to, dis you, you're, if you don't discover an error, that doesn't mean that you're not independent, right? That could mean that uh, you didn't conduct a very um, effective audit. Uh, that could just be simple, your audit risk, that you didn't uncover it because you don't provide absolute assurance because you don't look at 100% of the items or because a client is just very good at covering it up, right? So the fact that you didn't discover an error doesn't mean that you're not independent. You violated your independence if you discovered an error and did not report that error. 
then you violated your independence, right? Because it's your responsibility to, to report that error, right? So that's a, a pretty standard definition. So independence is covered under Rule 101. So of all of the standards that you're, we're going to talk about in terms of the professional standards, you must know Rule 101. So when I say Rule 101, it should just be instinctive. You know I'm talking about independence. I'm asking you about independence. So I'm going to tell you, independence is an extremely important uh, standard, and so it's very important that you understand independence, right, and the rules governing independence. So there are two, there are two components of independence, independence in fact and independence in appearance. And so the standards talk about independence in, in, in fact, right? Um, and, but most of the standards, are, the standards as written are really geared toward independence in appearance. And the reason for that is um, the standards, the appearance really deals with what's prohibited, what's allowed, you know, what constitutes a violation of independence. So for example, um, you have to be independent when you are conducting an audit engagement. So if you are assigned to an audit engagement, you have to be independent of that client. Also, you, it talks about uh, covered members. So not in addition to the auditor, right, there could be members of the auditor's family that are also have to, you know, uh, comply with this Rule 101 in the sense that if the auditor knows that his or her spouse is a CFO at the audit client, that auditor should not be on the audit engagement, right? So the, sp the fact that the spouse is a CFO it means that if that auditor is on that audit engagement, the auditor is violated independence. So we'll talk about covered member. But the, rep the re reality of it, independence is so important because it's important to users of the financial statements. The auditor has to provide, the users have to believe or have the perception that auditors are independent. Because if not, it, under, it, it undercuts their, you know, their reliance on the financial statements. So I was going to show you this, but I couldn't get it to come up. So when we talk about covered members, right, a covered member is any individual on the audit engagement, right? So if you're on the audit engagement, you cannot have a financial interest in the client, you, obviously, right? So, um, so any individual, any individual in a position to influence that engagement. So usually if you are a staff person, right, you um, might not have the ability to influence it because you don't sign off on the audit report and you have all these different levels that, um, that uh, you know, that will look over your work or review your work. So you really don't have that much. So you could be a staff person in that, au in that audit, in that audit firm, but you wouldn't be considered somebody who could influence an engagement. Right? Um, but if you are a staff person on the engagement, you have to be independent. So an individual in a position to influence the engagement would be somebody like a partner in that firm. Even though the partner is not on the audit engagement, that partner in the firm, in that office, might be able to influence the engagement. So they can have a financial interest in the client, even though it's not their audit client. Or even sometimes a manager, right? So uh, I, I just want to make a point, too, about most firms, and I would suggest that all the firms have their own, in addition to the minimum requirements of Rule 101, Audit firms will have their own requirements for independence uh, that their employees have to adhere to. So these are what, what I'm talking about, the minimum standards under Rule 101, and audit firms will have standards on top of that or requirements on top of that, which may be more restrictive. Um, so a partner or manager who provides non-attest services, right, so non-audit services to the client beginning once he or she provides 10 hours and so forth and so on. So basically, if, if you're providing some other service to that client, 
then again, even though it's not an audit engagement, the fact that you're providing other services to that client, you, um, and you're a partner or manager, you, you can't have uh, uh, a financial investment in the firm, in the, your client. Um, again, a partner in the office, any partner in the office, um, the firm, including the firm's employees and um, an employee benefit plan, um, and then any, you know, if you have, a, if, if there's a, a financial accounting policies that are controlled by any individuals or entities, um, uh, then they're also prohibited, right? So, but basically, uh, the, 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 the three that I want you to key in on are the fact that, one, any member of the audit team, that's an obvious one, uh, any member in the, aud in the audit firm that has the ability to influence that, and that's usually considered partner, the managing partner, so any partner in the firm, some cases a manager. Uh, uh, if you're providing uh, non-audit services to an audit client, and we'll talk about the fact that there's some prohibited services that uh, firms can't even provide to their audit clients. Okay. And so family members. So if I am, again, if my spouse is in a financial reporting role at an audit client, then I am not independent. So I should not be assigned to that audit. Okay. It ha it's only, so now if my spouse was in a non-financial, so let's say uh, my spouse was um, in charge of research and development, was a vice president of research and development. That person has no, a, research and a person in charge of research and development has no involvement with the financial statements or control over financial reporting. So my spouse would not be considered a covered member. Now, that being said, you know, a firm might say otherwise. But for the minimum requirements, requirements of the standard rule 101, my spouse would not be considered a covered member. There's, there are also, um, Prohibited financial relationships. Obviously, you can't have a direct financial interest in your client. Um, uh, and you can also, the other thing is we talk a lot about materiality. So um, if it's immaterial to your net worth, to that, to that person's net worth, to the, you know, let's say I have a $100 savings, bond, I mean, stock. A stock, uh, one share of stock or two shares of stock and they amount to $100. That's not going to be significant to your network, right? So materiality is also important. Um, you, you, when you read that there are certain types of personal loans um, that are, if you, you know, because people have to get mortgages and car notes and things of that nature, that would be uh, excluded. Um, also, business relationships, so the uh, independence is considered impaired if the CPA performs managerial or other significant um, financial role for the client. So in other words, you shouldn't be in a position where you're making decisions for the client. Right? So you would not expect to see, clearly you, the, you can't act as a CFO, you can't you shouldn't be a manager responsible for hiring, firing people, or assume a role of, of hiring or firing people. So you don't, you, you should, the business relationship that you should have with your client is providing assurance services um, and in, in limited situations, consulting services. Also, uh, we'll talk about this in a moment, but the cooling off period. So, and this actually came about, I think, after Enron. Um, the, the, the Enron and WorldCom. Because um, at Enron, so many of the accounting professionals at Enron were former Anderson employees. What they, you know, one of the concerns that the regulators had was that Anderson really kind of let things fly or di wasn't as diligent um, as they should have been or as skeptical as they should have been because they were basically dealing with former colleagues. Right, so they, um, you know, these people were now going over to work for the, the company. And, and, and sometimes right after the audit was over. So now what we have is a cooling off period where 
there has to be um, some, peri some period of time before uh, you can accept a position with a client after the audit. And I think for partners, I can't, rem I, I have it up here, I can't remember the exact number. I think it is, I'm pretty sure it's a year. Um, Sarbanes-Oxley Act, um, prior to Sarbanes-Oxley, firms could perform all types of consulting services, or there were very few consulting services that were prohibited. After Sarbanes-Oxley, it became more stringent. Um, and these are just some examples of the prohibited services. So audit firms can no longer um, pro provide internal audit outsourcing to their audit clients. So firms will have all of these services. They're only prohibited from providing it to their audit clients. They can provide it to other clients, not to their audit clients. Uh, obviously, they can't perform bookkeeping and accounting services. Uh, financial information systems designs and implementation and like and that's a big one the financial information system design and implementation was a big consulting um, you know uh, work for firms that they provided to their clients they can no longer do that uh, any broker dealer investment advisor services uh, actually internal audit outsourcing was another big consulting service that that firms did a uh, provide their clients that they can no longer do. So these are just some examples, or limited examples of what the services that they can't, they are not allowed to provide to their audit clients. Um, when we talk about, as I said, covered members also include family members. So um, a covered member uh, would, a family member, that would be your immediate family, such as your spouse uh, or spousal equivalent. Um, or your dependents. Um, they're also subject to Rule 101 interpretation. So if your spouse owns a significant investment in an audit client, then you are no longer independent, right? So you, if you, you cannot be on that, uh, assigned to that audit engagement because as the standards considered, your, it's your spouse or your spousal equivalent. If it's your dependent, you, especially if it's uh, minor children, they're going to be, you're responsible for managing their investment. So that's con that would also be considered uh, under Rule 101. Um, two situations uh, that can impair the independence if you, um, with a, a, a covered member would be, or a family member, is if you have a close relative who has a financial interest in that client, as I pointed that out. Um, the other thing is an individual participating in engagement has a close relative who could exercise in, in significant influence over the financial reporting or accounting policies. So those are the two things. One is a direct financial interest and the other is that the person is in a position to make decisions or control the financial reporting policy, uh, financial reporting or accounting um, policies, right? So those would be two, two areas where again, you're not independent if your spouse or spousal equivalent is in that role. Other types of family relationships would be close relatives, including your non-dependent children, so even if your children are adults, your brothers, your sisters, your parents, your grandparents, your parent-in-law, um, and their respective spouses. So notice no cousins, yes, Devin. Well, it, it creates a bad situation, but it, clearly if you don't know, if you're not talking to your, sp your, your sister or brother or your sibling and you have had no communications, um, then clearly you, you would have no way of knowing and you'd have to, you know, that would be your defense, right? It, it would be, I'm sure you would have some way of proving that you, you don't talk to them, right? You could, you know, family members could attest to the fact that you two are estranged and you don't talk to one another. Right, but it's that, you know, I was getting ready to say that's unusual, but, uh, you know, most people, for, for the most part, people may not like their siblings, but they kind of know what's going on, you know. Not, not even that, like, even if you do talk to, like, even your grandparents or parents a lot, like, they're not, even, how many, how many times are you going to talk to them about, like, who you're investing in and stuff like that? If they don't tell you or they're, like, real secretive about their portfolio, how are you supposed to do that? Right. I mean, 
mean, obviously, some of this, it, it, it has to be, you have to know it. Like, you can't be responsible for what you don't know. Right? But I, I also would think that, you know, when you talk about, uh, clearly, your, your children, you talk to more. So you're kind of aware of it. But also, because you know what your kids are doing, you know, um, and you, you might be of the mindset where you just kind of say, you know, like, I, these are our clients and, you know, or, or a client that I'm on, you know, as, as, do you have a fine? And that doesn't include, so this direct financial interest, right, is not if you have, because people are in mutual funds and you clearly can't control that, right? People are, so that's not what's, a direct financial interest is that you directly own, not that you own stock or you have an interest through your, you know, a mutual fund. Because if you think about it through a mutual fund, then it's not going to be significant, right? Because it, when you're in a mutual fund, the whole point is that you're diversifying. So you don't know, and you have no control over what that mutual fund is investing in. So that's different. Um, so yeah, you're not going to know that. But if people own stock in companies, you know, and you're right, you, you as an auditor, you can only say what you know. What you, know. you can't account for what you don't know. And, and so it is difficult. It really is. So I'm, I'm, I would assume that the statements that they sign, that they have to sign in the firm, it's based on what, to your knowledge, right? Not saying absolutely, because you can't. You're absolutely right. You don't know what your parents, or especially your parents-in-law, you don't know what they've invested in. So before you're sent out to a lot of engagement, but before you're assigned to a lot of engagement from a specific client, mm -hmm. you're asked as to um, this type of question as to the other Well, you, you're supposed to be aware, right? So you, sh as an auditor, you know what the minimum requirements of the, the um, the Rule 101 is, but also firms on a, a periodic basis will send out these independent, you know, these independent surveys or questionnaires, or I don't know what they call them, but they'll send it out where all, everyone in the firm, all employees in the firm or the auditors have to, you know, fill this, this fill it out in terms of, you know, what, or provide, um, or provide a list of their, their holdings, what their, what they're invested in, spouses, you know, what, so you have to provide it. So they do that on a, a regular basis. It's not, but you, as an auditor, should know if you have stock in a company, right? You're going to know that. So there's some, there's some level of, of, of expectation that if you are assigned to an audit engagement, you'll make sure that you're independent of that audit engagement. That's your responsibility as a professional in the firm. And that's your responsibility as a CPA. Um, the, uh, another thing, just uh, quickly, is if you are put in a position as an auditor where for some reason you're either suing your client or your client is threatening to sue you, you need to withdraw from the engagement because you're no longer independent. Right? So the, the standards are very clear about that. Right? If there's any, you're involved in, you bring litigation or the client brings litigation against you, or threatens to bring litigation against you, withdraw from the client because your independence will be impaired. Um, let's take, a, I want to skip that um, and talk about the SEC independence rule. So the SEC and the PCOB have independence requirements for auditors. And the independence requirements are basically that an auditor cannot audit his or her own work. Uh, it should not function in the role of management. Um, and they should not serve the client in an advocacy role, right? And so here, um, and some firms got into trouble or were, you know, kind of looked at a little closely um, with tax, right? Because you, can, there, you could cross that line on tax. So, you have, so taxes, if you'll notice, are not one of the services that are prohibited. Firms can still provide tax services to their clients, but they have to be very clear that they don't cross the line. Like, you shouldn't, you know, be an advocate for your client with, a, with respect to taxes. Also, in, in, you know, in terms of what you're advising them uh, from a tax perspective, you have to be very careful and not cross the line. Um, so, uh, and that's something that has been looked at. Um, in terms of whether it should be a prohibited services, but it, pro prohibited service, but it's not. It, auditors are still allowed to provide tax services to their clients. Um, so I want to go um, back to just 
one thing about independence that, okay, I messed up with that one. I want to talk about this concept of independence in appearance and independence in, a fa in fact. Independence in appearance is easier, in a way, to identify. You can identify uh, if an auditor has violated their independence or impaired their independence because they own stock in a company or because a spouse owns stock in a company. Right? You, you, that's it, it, because there's some output, some that you could see, right? You could test, there's, there's, some st there's something that you could say, the standard says you can't own stock, you own stock, you violated your independence. It's a little, independence and appearance is a little bit more objective, right? Um, to, and, and, and it's determined, in determining whether or not um, independence have been imp impaired. Independence, in fact, though, is very subjective and much more difficult to identify, right? So it, it's a very gray area. And it's an area that really uh, people or regulators make that assessment after something has happened. So it's an after the fact kind of hindsight look back at independence uh, being impaired. So, one of the things we would ask ourselves is, you're an auditor, uh, what, you're an auditor, it's, you, you know, you have this big client bringing in, generating a lot of fees, do you think an auditor might impair independence to keep the client? What might, how might that manifest itself? How, what kind of things would, would maybe raise a red flag? that would suggest that the auditor impair their independence, and why? What do you think? Independence, in fact. Maybe the time they've been working with a client? So, so tenure? Five, ten years. So audit tenure? But what, 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 so, an eval so the fact that an audit firm has worked with a client for ten years, it's a long audit tenure, doesn't mean the auditor has violated their independence. But what might be a red flag to make you think that an auditor possibly impaired their independence because of those types of things, the te their, their relationship, their long-term relationship with the client? Do they have forms of kind of relationship with management since they are constantly saving them a year, therefore they may mess something? Right, that's what I want you to get. It's an, an, an action, right? Something happened. <laughs> Right, Jimmy. What are you going to say? We'll talk about that. You're talking about rotation. We'll talk about that in a moment. Right. That's in a. That's to address this issue of independence. In fact, right. So the key, the 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 issue with independence. In fact, is that it kind of gets at these things. Okay, um, let's take Enron. And none of Anderson's employees, or none of the people on the audit, audit engagement, did they, um, to my knowledge, they didn't violate independence and, appear and appearance. They had no stock in the company, no financial, direct financial interest in the company. I don't think any of their, you know, the covered members did. What the regulators got at was that you allowed things to happen. You did not, what do we say about professional skepticism? They did not, they did not have a sufficient level of professional skepticism, this questioning mind. They didn't make a critical assessment of the evidence. Right? They allowed, and uh, some of, they allowed them to, even though they disagreed with, or initially disagreed with the way that the uh, Enron was accounting for these uh, related parties or SPEs, they let it pass. They allowed Enron to do it. So in, for a reasonable person kind of looking in, right, after the fact, I think most people kind of concluded that they impaired their independence. Or at least it appeared that they impaired, impaired their independence in fact. Right? That they, because of the relationship that they, so you look at the types of incentives that auditors have, right? You know, we, all, we talk about management's incentives to manage earnings, but the regulators are looking at auditors' incentives 
uh, to side with the client, to bias their opinions in favor of the client, especially in these areas where we have a lot of subjectivity. And some of the things that the, so the, you can't, how do you regulate that? That's very difficult to regulate. So this is what you're, so in order to try to mitigate these situations that auditors find themselves in where they might, you know, be uh, incented to impair their independence, right? The regulators have prohibited certain services, such as internal audit outside. They, they've, cons they've really, um, they've really uh, confined the amount of consulting services or the types of consulting services that auditors could perform. But, and their rationale for that was that, what, you know, in addition to, you know, the crossover of those services uh, might be um, creating uh, situations where the auditors are actually more involved in the preparation of financial statements than they should be, or decisions. Um, but the other thing is the, the vast amount of money that the audit firm is getting from these consulting firms, from these consulting services, and, and a lot of times, especially when you talk about systems implementation and design, those fees could far outweigh what auditors were getting um, for audit fees. Also, clients were pushing back on audit fees. They're like, look, you've been doing this audit for 10 years, same people, you shouldn't charge us this amount of money. We're provi so clients were giving pushback on audit fees. And so the money that, you know, not that they weren't making money off audits, but they were really making a lot of money off of consulting services. So regulators felt like, look, they didn't want to lose the consulting services, and that's a carrot that, you know, the, this client, or a stick that the client can hold over their heads. And they're aware of this. So let's start to, pro let's prohibit these types of services, right? The other thing is this, this rotation, right? Mandatory rotation. And that gets to both what Jimmy and Ella were talking about, is because of your audit tenure, um, you know, and re you've reformed the relationship with that client. Maybe you are a little too comfortable. Maybe you're not as skeptical as you need to be. Uh, you know, you build trust. You, and, and it's ridiculous to think that if you're going to be on an audit for 10 years or seven years, whatever, that you're not going to form relationships with your clients. And it doesn't mean that, you know, you're, you just, you know, if the person is a good person, you like them, you have similar interests, and, you know, maybe your kids even go to the same school, right? You don't know. You, it's, you're a human being. So you're going to have a relationship, form some type of relationship. It's not going to be an adversarial relationship. And so then you, maybe you let your skepticism, your guard down a little bit. So um, partners have to rotate off of the audit client, not the firm, the partner, the lead partner, the engagement partner. So these are the types of things that the regulators have instituted to try or, you know, or implemented to, to try to, to get at this, I, this problem of impairment of independence in fact because it's very difficult to regulate. You can't regulate independence, in fact, because only an auditor truly knows whether or not they violated independence, in fact, right? Because only an auditor knows if they allowed their own incentives, their relationship with the client, their concern over maintaining that client as an audit client, or you know, the possibility of more con business from that client, only the auditor knows if they allow that to color their judgment. You or I can only assume that after the fact. If something happened or we're looking at this and say, oh, you know, that doesn't make sense and here are the reasons why it doesn't make sense and here's why the auditor did it. We can only assume that after the fact. Regulators can only assume that after the fact. Right? You can't regulate it. So that's why you see some of these. Another thing, um, uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit more when we talk about audit reports, but now there's this, this, um, this, this uh, uh, proposal by the PCAOB to change the audit report, right? Because right now the audit report's one page and, you know, and it says what it says about whether or not the financial statements are in accordance with generally accepted account of principles, free of material misstatement, reasonable assurance, and all of those buzzwords, right? Now they're talking about actually including a discussion of critical audit issues encountered. So twofold, one, to uh, 
create greater transparency for the users of the financial statements, but also the auditors now see, have to disclose this information in the audit report, there's greater accountability, right? So now there are more people reading this. It raises more questions. So the, again, they're thinking then auditors will be more skeptical. They'll be less, you know, they'll, they'll challenge their clients more, right? Because now it's in the audit report. PCOB now has oversight over the financial. Before auditors, the audit profession was self-regulated, now the PCOB regulates them. So this is really the regulator's response, um, in law, you know, not solely for, but a, a great deal of it is the concern is over audit independence. And it's not audit independence in appearance that they were concerned about, it was audit independence in fact. So make sure you understand the distinction between when an auditor uh, I'm sorry, between audit independence in appearance and independence in fact. The standards 101 clearly addresses independence in appearance. Independence in fact is much more difficult. Okay. Uh, so here's what we're talking about, the cooling um, uh, rotation. Okay. Um, and the cooling off. So there's a one-year cooling off period. Uh, this didn't exist before Sarbanes-Oxley, but now it does. Uh, it has to occur before a member of the audit engagement team can accept a key management position at a client. And a key management position, again, is one where you'll have decisions and control over financial accounting policies, financial reporting policies. That's a key decision. If you go and work at the client as, you know, a, an analyst, a financial statement analysis, doing financial statement analysis, you know, you're a staff person. You have no control, right? So they're not talking about that. They're talking about key positions. So usually you're seeing, you know, people like managers and partners moving into these positions. And there's a one-year cooling off period. Yes, Ella. Is it allowed for a firm to actually work for a client for more than 20 years? Yeah. Okay. yeah. There's no firm rot audit firm rotation okay. requirement. So I'll tell you this, a firm who has two partners cannot audit a publicly held company. You have to be registered with the SEC. Uh, I don't think you, but then a municipality is not a publicly held company. These rules apply to publicly held companies, right? So this cooling off period is that's, and thanks for me, a, actually asking that question. This applies to publicly held companies, okay, this cooling off period, right? So, and, but, and remember, for publicly, in order to audit publicly held companies, a firm has to register with the SEC. And so you won't, so the majority of publicly held companies are audited by the major public accounting firms, the big four, and then the second tier firms like Grant Thornton, BDO, and you know, those firms, right? That's where the majority, and, and larger regional firms, the majority of your publicly held companies are audited by those type firms. So you, you won't have a, a, a firm that has like two partners auditing a, a publicly held company. So cooling off period. Um, and also the other thing is clients have to, you know, and firms have their rules. And they'll establish these rules and talking to the, for, and the other thing I want to point out, management doesn't hire the auditor. The audit committee hires the auditor. That's a change after Sarbanes-Oxley. And again, you, uh, a, a reaction uh, to try to, to, to get at this concept of independence in fact, right? T trying to, uh, with these standards or these rules that the uh, PCOB and the SEC has instituted, what they're trying to do is mitigate this, this, the circumstances where auditors will, will violate their or impair, put auditors in a position of impairing their independence in, in fact, right? Because they realize that they can't regulate that really. So what they could do is tr institute rules or implement rules that would try to mitigate the circumstances where that occurs. Um, so the audit committee hires the auditors and that, um, again, so it removes that relationship, right? 
between managers, management. So management can hold that as a stick over the auditor. Um, the other thing is that I want to point out is if you are a staff person or an auditor on an audit engagement and a client, the client should not approach you about a job without having talked to the partner or the manager on the engagement. But if they do, it is your responsibility to now go to your partner or your manager and say, look, you know, the client approached me about a job. Because, and it happens more times than not, because think about it. It's, you're at their client, you know the client, you're working there, they get to interview you basically, right? They see you, they interact with you, if they like you and they're like, oh, this is a you know, bright, intelligent person and we would love to have this person in our organization. So clients, I mean, you know, their auditors are a big source of potential employees for them. So it happens more times than not, but it's your responsibility that, that audit is going on. They should not approach you, right? They should contact the partner and they, it should not be done until after the audit report is issued. Right? And so, and firms will be very clear about that with their clients. They'll be, the, you know, they'll specify that with their clients. Um, that you should not approach any of our employees. I, when I was in, um, before I, I, I went back to school to get my doctorate, the company that I worked for, um, I was actually leaving the company. Um, and so I interviewed with, uh, decided I was going to go back into public accounting, but in a different role. So I interviewed with, with the firm. I didn't think anything of it because I was in, you know, I was in no way involved in financial reporting at all. Um, I had, and clearly I, I wasn't the CFO or the controller, so I had no control over financial reporting or accounting policies. I was in a totally different area. Um, and I wasn't even doing accounting. And, but I interviewed with this company, and I interviewed with this firm for a consulting, in their consulting division. Um, and, you know, I took the interview, and they interviewed me, and it was going to move to the next step. And they said, well, we need to, con you know, we need to contact your firm. We need to contact the company. We need to contact the CFO, the controller, and let them know that we're interviewing you. And I had no problem with that because, again, I wasn't in a role, uh, so I wasn't concerned about the controller knowing that I was looking to leave the company. Um, but even that. So firms are very, very um, conscientious about that. Um, and so it's, it just, it's just an FYI. You need to make sure that if a client does approach you about a job that you make them aware of the fact, you make the partner aware of the fact that you've been approached by a client. The other thing that Sarbanes-Oxley instituted was this rotation, partner rotation. Now, firms always had partner rotation, um, at least when I was in public accounting, the firm that I worked for, and I have no reason to believe that um, it wasn't the same for all other firms, had a, a mandatory rotation. However, in the firms, it was kind of loosey-goosey, right? You know, it said seven years, but I think it was seven years. Um, but, you know, you could play around with it, right? You could get around those rules. Now, Sarbanes-Oxley says, nope, you have to rotate. At, the partner has to rotate off that audit engagement in, after five years. There's no getting around the rules. Right, so Sarbanes-Oxley instituted, or, you know, this rule, or imposed this on, the, on firms. So firms, you know, have to deal with that, you know. And uh, clients, they have to, because the things that clients like, are, they like continuity. Right? They don't want to see new auditors, and certainly they don't want to see new partners coming in. Right, because they feel like they have to now get you up to speed all over again. Right. So that does have an impact on the client's biz on the comp on the firm's business, and, and they have to manage that relationship with their firm with their clients. Um, and so you know now firms obviously they have no way around it. So they have you know this this whole transition process in place uh, for clients, uh, the engagement team for clients when they have the engagement partner rolling off. And then uh, obviously we already talked about ownership interests. You can't have. Um, any ownership interest in your clients at all. Okay, so that's rule 101. And that's the, that is the rule you must know inside and out. Okay, these other rules, you need to be aware of them. Um, we're not gonna spend, you know, a whole lot of time talking about them, but just make sure that you know that there are these rules of, con other rules of conduct. But the thing that you, I want you to know without any doubt, without any hesitation is rule 101. 
the intricacies of, of in the ind uh, independence rules. Um, you have uh, obviously integrity and objectivity. That goes without saying. You expect professionals to have integrity. You expect auditors to be objective, right? That's a, it, that kind of goes hand in hand with, with uh, providing a professional service. Uh, there are some general standards, um, professional competence, planning and supervision, due professional care, uh, sufficient relevant data, right? So uh, this goes with the conduct of the audit, right? Um, compliance with standards, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but uh, rule 203, accounting principles, um, confidential client information is rule 301. Basically, you have to make sure that you recognize that your clients are hiring you. The information that they provide you is confidential. So you as auditors, you can't go around, you find out some information because you're auditing that client. You can't go around telling your friends that or, you know, or your, your spouse or your parent. That, that, that's client confidential information. Um, just some other rules, contingent fees, commissions and referral fees. I'm not, you know, not going to ask you to memorize those or, you know, it's just these are, these are what, these are the rules that make up uh, the rules of conduct. So remember, I talked about the three aspects of the uh, generally accepted accounting principles. So we talked about responsibilities. And the biggest, the most important rule out of there is independence, right? So we talked about that. Then it's the, another set of rules, the performance principle, deals with the conduct of the audit, right? So the goal here is that the auditor provides reasonable assurance. And so what the performance principle is dealing with is how the auditor goes about what are the rules that they have to follow to go about conducting an audit obtaining evidence to be able to provide an opinion, a, a reasonable assurance about the financial statements. So the performance principle covers planning and supervision. So when we talk about engagement planning, we'll talk about this more, what, what the auditor's responsibilities are. So, you know, staffing the job with the, the appropriate level of people, staffing the job with someone who has experience and expertise in a particular area. So if you're going to go out and audit um, a broker dealer, you should want, you should have a, an engagement team that has experience there, at minimum, the partner and the manager, and, and the senior should too, but at a minimum, the partner and the manager should have in, uh, expertise or experience auditing broker dealers. Right? So that's the planning and supervision and the preparation of the audit. Materiality, um, we'll talk more about materiality when we cover that in a couple of weeks, but uh, the auditor has to take that, they have to consider that, because you, you're saying that the financial statements are free of material misstatements. You have to define what materiality is, and there are benchmarks that auditors use to define that, and we'll talk about quantitative versus qualitative materiality. Um, uh, risk assessment, huge. Risk assessment, audits are risk-based uh, risk audits. The PCOB, in selecting audit engagements to review, Risk is the driver of that. They, uh, they identify those audits, that engagements that carry the highest risk. So we'll talk more about risk assessment in a few weeks, but basically you have to be able to understand where the risk is and to develop your audit approach around those areas that present the greatest amount of risk. Um, and then audit evidence, which we'll talk about when we talk about um, audit planning in a little, a little bit. Uh, so sufficiency. You have to have sufficient and appropriate. Sufficiency deals with the quantity, and appropriateness deals with the quality of that evidence. And I'll go into that more when we talk about um, uh, the uh, performance of an audit. So we'll co we'll come to that as we throughout um, as we go throughout the topics of, of talking about the audits of the revenue cycle, the audits of internal controls, we'll talk more about the sufficiency and quant, uh, quality of, of evidence that the auditor obtains. And then the final part, uh, component of GAS would be the reporting principles. And this really deals with the fact that the auditor is being hired to express an opinion on the financial statements. And so this covers, uh, the financial reporting framework covers 
what types of opinions the auditors should issue. So what's, what circumstances give rise to different types of opinions? So when we talk about reporting at the end of the semester, we'll get into this in more detail. But basically, auditors issue a report on the financial statements and reports on, um, on internal controls over financial reporting. And we'll go into that in more detail. So basically, the framework sets out the criteria for the report. You'll see when we talk about reporting that there are several types of reports that an auditor can issue. We'll talk more about what gives rise to each of those reports, those opinions. Um, so basically, the major items in the auditor's report is the auditor identifies that the responsibilities of the financial statement belongs to management, and the auditor is responsible for examining evidence. Uh, uh, or, uh, and, you know, assertions uh, of gathering evidence uh, related to the assertions that management makes about the financial st amounts included in the financial statements uh, that is conducted in accordance with PCOB standards of publicly held company, um, opinion on the financial statements, and then an opinion on internal control over financial reporting. So that's the, the basic elements of the or major items in the auditor's report. And then finally, the the last part of the professional standards also deal with quality control. And quality control standards basically applies to the firm. So what kind of standards does the firm have in place um, to ensure that audits are being conducted in accordance with the firm standards, obviously, and in accordance with generally accepted auditing standards or PCOB standards? Um, the CPA firms, um, no long, prior to PCOB, the CPA firms kind of uh, were members of the AICPA uh, quality control um, program where peer, their peers would come, you know, on a rotational basis, come out and audit, um, you know, select engagements for an audit firm and, and, and perform a peer review. So. Um, KPMG might audit Deloitte, Deloitte might audit Ernst, so forth, right? Um, and that was a part of their, their the um, AICPA program. I'm assuming that firms are still in that, but I, you know, I really don't know. But firms who have publicly held clients have to be, they have no choice. The PCOB will come in and select engagements. And again, the PCOB is going to focus on a more risk-based approach. They're going to come in and select engagements to review. And I strongly suggest that you take a I put the PCOB website up, I think, um, on the syllabus. But if it's not, you could just uh, kind of Google PCOB and just kind of take a look at some of uh, the PCOB inspection reports. You don't have to read them in detail. But just to give you a feel for the kinds of um, you know, audits that the PCOB is doing of the firms and what kind of issues they're finding. And one of the things you're, you're going to see throughout their inspection reports is this concept of professional skepticism. You know, one of their conclusions, a major conclusion that they have is that firms are not, or audit teams are not engaging in sufficient and appropriate level of professional skepticism. Um, and, you know, so they're citing them a lot for that. So to be, I, I strongly suggest you take a look at that. So, yeah, so now the PCOB performs this audit of these firms. And I've spoken to uh, represented partners and managers in the firms who've gone through these PCOB audits, and they said it is really brutal, right? Very brutal process. Um, and, you know, and the, the findings are kind of general. Um, so it won't say, their inspection reports won't say necessarily that we audited Deloitte and this is what we found. Um, but now they're starting to, do, initially they were not doing that unless the firms did not respond um, to the, uh, the recommendations. But now they're starting to do that. So I think you can go on and see that there, you know, several of the firms, uh, I, I, Deloitte comes to mind because I just saw that one a few weeks ago. but that they've actually released their, their report on their inspection of uh, audits performed by Deloitte. So, um, you know, that's something that the firms now have to deal with. Um, elements of quality control includes leadership, tone at the top. You'll hear this when we talk about internal controls. But, you know, the firms, the national office, the, the, the uh, office managing partner, they set the tone. Other things is ethical requirements. We'll talk about ethics next week. Uh, the clients, the firm should have client acceptance and continuance process. We'll talk about that when we talk about planning. Um, you can't really see this here, human resources. That's their hiring practices, making sure, you know, that they're hiring people like yourself who are, 
you know, prepared to come in. They have the necessary qualifications for, to, to operate as auditors. Uh, monitoring the, the engagement performance. Um, so these are all uh, elements of the quality control that firms should have, and you know about the PCLB, so I won't go in, but the PCLB basically um, regulates the accounting profession, or, uh, whereas before we were, they were self-regulated. Okay, so here you'll see that firms that have greater than 100 um, public entities, so we're talking about then obviously you're talking about all of the major four, big four firms and the major firms, they definitely have more than 100 public companies. They're being audited on an annual basis. Um, and then those who have less than or equal to 100 are audited every three years. So, so maybe perhaps some of the smaller regional firms. Um, and then here's the website that you can find. And I, the, these notes are posted, slides are posted on Blackboard, but here's where you can find, you can go to the PCOB webpage and you'll see uh, the various reports that they've issued, inspection reports that they've issued.